Welcome to DivCasts from University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Welcome to Swift Hall, home of the University of Chicago Divinity School, and the site of the Conference Augustine, Theological and Philosophical Conversations, which I'm happy to note convenes on the feast day of St. Mark. <laughs> Before we begin to hear the first set of the very many interesting words we shall hear in the next couple of days about Augustine, a few initial remarks, certainly not the final ones, are in order about the colleague in whose honor this conference takes place. David Tracy is the Andrew Thomas Greeley and Grace McNichols Greeley Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus at the Divinity School of the University of Chicago, where he has also held appointments in the Committees on Social Thought and the Analysis of Ideas and the Study of Methods. David is a native of Yonkers, New York, and he completed his secondary schooling and his undergraduate studies at St. Joseph's Seminary and Cathedral College, and his graduate education at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, with his licentiate in sacred theology in 1964 and his doctorate in 1969. Between the completion of the licentiate and the commencement of his doctoral studies, David spent what is widely but somewhat elliptically described as a notable year as assistant pastor of St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church in Stanford, Connecticut, where, if I am correctly informed, William F. Buckley was an appreciative member of David's form. David was appointed instructor in theology at Catholic University in 1967, and after serving there for two years, joined the Divinity School as assistant professor of theology in 1969. He has, happily for Chicago, remained at the Divinity School ever since despite the blandishments of numerous other institutions who exerted themselves assiduously but ultimately unsuccessfully to claim some share of our manifest good fortune in the ensuing three plus decades. Chicago's delight and others' disappointment has its tangible signifier in David's remarkable record of publication, launched with the achievement of Bernard Lonergan and carried forward in such works as Blessed Rage for Order, The Analogical Imagination, and Plurality and Ambiguity, David has pursued with uncommon diligence, unparalleled range of reference, and steadfast tenacity nothing less than a comprehensive rethinking of the project of theology and its negotiation of the legacy of modernity and its discrepant aftermaths. In a series of volumes that were immediately must-reads for anyone interested not just in theology but in thought about religion, books that continually repay our return to them, David Tracy has given us a vocabulary and a syntax for thinking with new integrity about, to name several of many major themes, God, tradition, the classic, pluralism, ambiguity, hermeneutics, and radical evil. These signal constructive contributions go hand in hand throughout his writing with a sustained attention to history and tradition. Of no other Catholic theologian, I would suggest, can it be said with confidence in both its historical and its constructive import that his favorite theologian is Martin Luther. <laughs> <laughs> to discuss David's special dis that may not be true after this conference. <laughs> <laughs> to discuss David's special distinction as a published scholar does not, however, exhaust what one must praise because, to a degree that is to the best of my knowledge unique in Swift Hall, David Tracy has been in his time on this faculty at least as significant as a conversation partner. The care and the seriousness of his engagement with the work of others, faculty and students alike, is legendary and bespeaks a generosity of mind and of spirit that, while endlessly plural, is decidedly not ambiguous. More books written by this faculty, more ideas spawned at the centers and also around the edges of dissertations have been informed by his sympathetic and discerning attention. No one on this faculty has taught more widely or more successfully with such a range of colleagues. This community enjoys the stamp of that attention and has benefited signally from the intellectual nuclear energy that is David Tracy. For all these reasons, it could be nothing but simple justice to declare that the colleague we honor with this conference is the preeminent theologian of this generation. David Tracy is the most stellar and exemplary Roman Catholic participant in that field but he is equally clearly the Christian theologian whose works claim the broadest audience at the deepest level, both across the traditions and throughout the academy and the public. 
He enjoys significant and appreciative and ongoing interlocutors among philosophers, literary critics, historians of religion. And while it is probably true that Paul Tillich's placement as Time's Man of the Year in 1961 will prove unique for the foreseeable future, David's appearance on the cover of the New York Times Magazine a quarter of a century later is, from my vantage point at least, an even more signal accomplishment of recognition from a public less innately inclined than it was in Tillich's day to attend the theology. David's appointment in 1989 to a Greeley professorship in Catholic studies signaled his remarkable capacity to be deeply Catholic in both the upper and lower case usages of the word, an example never more relevant to our work in my judgment than at the present moment. Like the theologian whose work we will be discussing, David's career has been one of incessant and inspired engagement with a world that has had more than a few surprises in store for all of us. It is a great pleasure and a privilege to participate in this utterly fitting celebration of continuing theological presence and contribution, and a delight to salute his enormous accomplishment with this stellar event in Swift Hall. Now, for that event, there are many people to thank, but I want especially to express gratitude and appreciation, all too briefly, but very sincerely, to Professors Susan Schreiner and Clark Gilpin for spearheading this occasion, and to Mrs. Sandra Peppers and Mr. David Lyons for their labors to make it all work. They've also asked me to note two things. One is that if, as of 4 p.m. today, the new city press will be set up outside the lecture hall with excellent editions of Augustine for your purchase. And secondly, the Divinity School is now podcasting such events. And if you'd like to be on the email list to gain immediate access to them, there are sign-up sheets outside. So I'm now very pleased to turn over this opening session of the conference to Robert Pippin the Evelyn Stephenson Neff Distinguished Service Professor in the Committee on Social Thought, the Department of Philosophy in the College. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be associated with uh, any event in honor of one of the most insightful and humane colleagues. It's been my privilege to serve with uh, over the last mm -hmm. many years. Um, the uh, session today has an economical title, Session One. <laughs> it has three, three speakers who are seated in the order in which they'll talk, John Cavalini, Willoughby Alton, and Bernard McGinn. Uh, I'll introduce them in the order in which they speak, uh, before each one speaks, because if you like me, you'll, you'll forget everything I say at the beginning when it comes to the term. Uh, professor Cavadini is Associate Professor of Theology at the University of Notre Dame. He is a scholar of patristic and early medieval theology with special interest in the theology of Augustine and in the history of biblical exegesis, both Eastern and Western. His publications include Miracles in Christian and Jewish Antiquity, Imagining the Truth, and The Last Christology of the West, Adoptionism in Spain and Gaul. He will speak to us today about solidarity and ideology in Augustine's City of God. <laughs> surpass understanding 
is also intensified and specified by the focus on the embodied eternal life of the saints. Augustine opens for the reader a more dramatic and perhaps even unsettling view as he entertains the possibility that we might actually be able to see God with our bodily eyes. Although the resurrection body is a spiritual body, it is still a body, and the eyes will be enough like our eyes now that we will be, we will be able to open and close them. That bodily eyes might be able to see something immaterial directly is the astonishing possibility that Augustine holds out for our consideration. The City of God closes with this, the ultimate limit of the imagination, and the challenge to the imagination laid out for us. There is bound to be a spoil sport in this play of the imagination, and not unsurprisingly, the reasoning of the philosophers survive, arrives just in time to play that role. Indeed, we could say that throughout Book 22, Augustine takes the philosophers to task, especially the Platonist philosophers, for what we might call a premature foreclosure of the imagination. Book 22 has its, ob as its object a discussion of the eternal bliss of the city of God. And Augustine keeps emphasizing that whatever else this bliss may be, it is an embodied bliss. In Augustine's rehearsal of the objections of the, of the philosophers, he presents a picture of intellectual complacency, a contemptuous refusal to expand the imagination beyond received wisdom, and a prideful reluctance to follow where the imaginations of the masses of believers have led. He says, against the force of such great authority, he's talking about the prophets, learned and wise men flatter themselves on presenting a shrewd argument against the resurrection of the body when they quote what Cicero has to say in the third book of the De Republica. Quote, to them the quote, nature would not allow what comes of the earth to dwell anywhere but on the earth. Such is the impressive reasoning of the wise, Augustine dryly remarks. But he adds, citing 90, Psalm 94, 11, God knows their thoughts, how futile they are. And he invites the reader into a thought experiment. What if we were not embodied spirits in heaven, who knew nothing of earthly creatures, and someone were to suggest to us that we ourselves would someday be linked with earthly bodies by some miraculous bond to give life to those bodies? Perhaps we would argue that nature does not allow an incorporeal substance to be bound by a corporeal tie. But such an argument would only serve to demonstrate our complacency and unwillingness to imagine anything but what we have experienced, since the world is actually full of such creatures, souls connected to and bound up with bodies in what Augustine calls a mysterious way, Miro Modo. The thought experiment also serves to analyze Platonist refusal to believe in the resurrection of the body. The major problem is really, we see, embodiment itself, considered as a constitutive and permanent feature of human life, and indeed a constitutive feature of all life on Earth. If we were thinking rightly, Augustine remarks, it is actually much less incredible that at the appropriate time as decreed by God, Corporeal reality should be exalted to heavenly abodes that are nevertheless themselves corporeal, then that an inherently superior element, the immaterial soul, should be intimately linked to or even bound by inferior material reality. This is inherently much more wonderful, molto mirabilis, and we should be more shocked into wonder or more violently amazed at this conjunction. But we have become complacent because it is so commonplace. Book 22 continues on as a book of wonders and miracles, all centered on the body and the renewal of the body. The resurrection and ascension of Christ himself, preached by the unlikely ministrations of uneducated fishermen, have been believed worldwide, supported by miraculous signs of healing. And if one finds these miracles too incredible, then one is left with one grand miracle over all, namely, that these uneducated preachers were believed without any miracles to support them. We have a community of new vision, of possibility, of imagination, straining forward with Augustine to imagine the life to come, both bodily and eternal. Even now, miracles of bodily healing are attested and recorded in witness to the faith which pro 
proclaims that Christ rose in the flesh and ascended into heaven with the flesh. Returning to the objections of the Platonist Radio Senatores, that's an insult word. <laughs> Augustine recounts another argument of theirs against God's great gift of the resurrection. Based on the order and level of elements in the universe, Although they believe in the true transcendent God, Augusta notes that the, that the Platonist's radiocination amounts to nothing more than an interested line of reasoning that ignores common violations of the so-called fixed order, including once again, and most especially, the conjunction of body and soul itself, something they habitually denigrate by overlooking, and on that basis place undue limits on the power of the God they supposedly know. Augustine then takes up, one by one, particular objections brought forward, all of them underwritten in some way by the limitation of the imagination in which he has, has shown Platonism to be invested. By his own flight of the imagination, he shows that these objections proceed from a premature foreclosure of the imagination. It is not so difficult to imagine God restoring what was lost by age, completing what was cut off by a premature death and preserving intact the gender of the body for both women and men. It is only if you have lost all wonder at your own being in the first place, lost a sense of the original wonder of yourself as constituted by the link between body and soul, that you would believe its preservation and perfection beyond imagining. Augustine is aware of the provisional character of what he imagines here, namely, that we will all have the corp corporeal appearance of 33-year-olds. <laughs> kind of like CNN. <laughs> the age at which Christ died. It is essentially an image of wholeness, defined by the attainment of the stature of the full maturity of Christ mentioned in Ephesians 4.13. This also involves the healing of all deformities, though the wounds of the martyrs will remain at least in the form of glorious scars, so that our affection for them can be continually kindled. From this we can infer that any physical mark of one's witness to Christ, essentially one's whole identity, insofar as it was a witness to faith, will remain intact. Despite the provisional character of these imaginings, the passage from Ephesians has another reference, which contextualizes them less provisionally, namely, to the maturity and perfection of the body of Christ, the Church. Augustine quotes Ephesians 4, at length, supplementing with other passages from 1 Corinthians, which makes it clear that the stature of the perfect maturity of Christ is not only a reference to the individual resurrection body, but also to the church, perfectly built up in charity, so that it is the fully grown up body of Christ, the head. This is an image of solidarity and love. It is a solidarity that is the product of a long process of reformation, described in Romans 12, too, which is what Augustine quotes here. Don't be conformed to this world, but be reformed in the newness of your mind. And Augustine tells us this means a process of being contoured or conformed to God's Son. The fact that women retain their sex in the resurrection body is significant not only because gendered reality is part of the original wonder of embodiment, but also that the creation of Eve from Adam is an indication of the unity that should exist between the spouses, and so a foreshadowing of the unity of Christ in the church. The sleep of Adam foreshadows the death of Christ, and the church is born as he hung lifeless on the cross. That is, the church is born of Christ's total self-gift of love. Augustine only Adam writes here what we can find more fully exposited in his preaching. The reformation of the church away from conformation to the world is a reformation in the love of Christ that was at once the creation and the espousal of the church. And its perfection is its complete configuration to that charity or love. Its perfect embodiment of it, one could say. In other words, it is Christ who defines our expectations and so the scope of the imagination, because it is Christ's love by which we are being reformed and to which we are being conformed. This reformation and conformation is also a formation of the imagination, away from the limitations imposed by the world, 
especially in their most prestigious form in Platonism. From the point of view of this reforming according to the love of Christ, one begins to see not only the next world, but also this one, here and now, with renewed vision. One can see the sadness and misery of the fallen world and recognize it for what it is. And it also retained a sense of the stunning beauty, even of the fallen world, of the sea with its many colors, the light in its abundance and wonderful, miraculous loveliness, the sun, the moon, and stars, the astonishing activities of ants and bees, and of the countless forms and species of living things. And what is most marvelous of all, the presupposition of all this life, the union of immaterial soul and material body. Augustine says, this is a work of such wonder and grandeur as to astound the mind that seriously considers it, and to begin praise of the Creator. And this is true not only as that work is observed in a human being, a rational being, and on that account of more excellence and greater worth than all other creatures, but even in the case of the tiniest fly. In Christ we are reformed away from the complacency of the world and the Platonist philosophy which underwrites it, into a renewed sense of awe and wonder at the gift of the original creation. And so we have the wherewithal and warrant to imagine something even more wondrous as the new heavens and the new earth that include bodies raised for eternal life. The solidarity of the new society, the new fellowship, bound by the reforming power of Christ's love, is the basis for the reimagining of our world as it is now, and the world which it will become, where we will be occupied in the perfect worship of God. The discussion of the church as Christ's body in Book 22 recalls a more in-depth discussion of this matter earlier in Book 10, where the question to be discussed was specifically what constitutes true worship of God. More specifically, the question in Book 10 engages a polemic against Platonists and particularly Porphyry's endorsement or toleration of the worship of gods less than the one true and transcendent God. Augustine had established as early as Book 8 that Plato and his philosophical descendants knew the one true God. For Augustine, the problem with Platonism, however, was always summed up by Romans 1, 21 through 22. Though recognizing God, they have not glorified it as God, nor given him thanks. For proclaiming themselves wise, they have become fools, and have exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for images representing the corruptible. In other words, Although they recognized the true God, they refused to worship him properly and continued instead to tolerate or endorse polytheistic worship. It is the recognition of this inconsistency and the desire to analyze and repudiate it that brings Augustine in Book 10 to ask precisely what constitutes true worship of God and the worship that will make the worshiper happy. It is, he says, designated by the Greek term latreia, and after examining the matter further, concludes that the essence of Latreia is sacrifice, for no one would argue that sacrifice is due to anyone but God. True worship of God is a matter of the heart, and the external sacrifices are signs or sacraments of the true sacrifice of the heart, which Augustine says is mercy or compassion, when done for the sake of God. Acts of compassion or works of mercy depending on how you translate, opera misericordiae, are meant to help us lose the form of worldly desire and to be reformed by submission to God. That is not as easy as, as it may seem, in case you were thinking it was easy. <laughs> as Augustine had pointed out in the very first book, in the preface to the whole city of God, the city of this world, that is the fellowship of human beings and angels, defined by worldly desire, and most visibly represented in the worldly empire, boasts precisely of mercy as its greatest accomplishment. Quote, the king and founder of this city of God has revealed in the scripture of his people that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. This is God's prerogative, but the arrogant spirit of man and its swelling pride has claimed it as its own, and delights to hear this verse quoted in its own praise, to spare the conquered, 
and beat down the proud from the idiot. The form of worldly desire is pride, and it reveals itself in the desire for praise. The perversion of works of mercy into self-glorification is in fact the special work of empire, so that what is the very best act a human being can perform, revealing the human being at his or her most generous, free and loving state, fails to achieve its true end in glorifying God, the creator of this human being, and instead is turned toward the glorification of the empire, who spares the conquered in dramatic acts of mercy, only to solidify its grasp on the imaginations of oppressed and oppressor. This perversion of compassion is the primal blight of the imagination. That which would reflect in human beings the beauty of God's form, and so offer praise to God, is reduced to a moment in the project of self-glorification, of the quest for prestige, until there seems to be nothing left than the quest for praise and prestige, and no greater purpose for human beings to serve than to contribute their personal prestige to the glory of the empire, and to receive personal prestige in return. The empire comes to define the scope of human excellence, virtus, by co-opting the very worship of God, compassion, for its own self. Under this regime, an actual, pure work of compassion, done for the sake of God, that is, for no ulterior motive, as we might say today, is unimaginable, because it would be seen to be done for absolutely nothing, an unimaginably deep sacrifice undertaken without hope of any benefit whatsoever. That, of course, is a precise description of the sacrifice of Christ in his incarnation and passion. It is an unimaginable act of mercy or compassion, in which the Word, through whom all things were made, became flesh and dwelt among us. The Church comes into being by this sacrifice. It is a fellowship, a societas, defined by God's compassion, conformed to it, and in that way, undergoing purification from the form of worldly love. In other words, the sacrifice of Christ creates a community whose very existence is formed or defined by non-worldly love, by the humility of God the Word in assuming human nature, by that humility represented and enacted in human nature by Jesus Christ's death on the cross, and the continuing presence of that sacrifice in the bonds of mutual love formed among the members of his church, his body. The body of Christ is the compassion of Christ, present as a fellowship in transformation, in renovation, in reformation. This solidarity in transformation is sacramentally represented and enacted in the Eucharist. The church is a congregatio societasque, congregation and fellowship, offered to God as a universal sacrifice to the great priest that we might be his body. In other words, we are not purified by our own power or excellence, virtus, but by the Eucharistic mercy or compassion of God, which defines us and which conforms our works, our poor little allotment of virtue, to that mercy. We don't have to fall back on the narrow mercy of our own hearts. We don't have to fall back on whatever speck of excellence, virtus, we might muster up, hoping all the while to put it on our personal CVs, <laughs> to ensure we'll go down in history, in the archives of magnificent compassion. I'm keeping track of mine. <laughs> <laughs> the perfect worship of God is the Eucharistic life, the continual offering of Christ to us and for us, the continual formation of a societas whose loves and works are being transformed in Christ's compassion and configured to it. Here is a solidarity which is a clear alternative to the empire, not as another political entity, not as another worldly city, but as a fellowship of love available to people of any nation or city. And it provides immediate perspective on the imperial project shows it up for the limited enterprise it truly is, for the shocking limitation of vision and imagination that it always has been. The fact that the solidarity is not an alternative state or earthly city is what is captured in the metaphor Augustine uses frequently in the text, especially in the latter books, 
that of pilgrimage. If there is anything that has a claim to being the just society on earth, it is this pilgrim people, precisely not as another worldly entity or power, as yet another settled perfection, claiming praise for itself, but a fellowship founded in the humility of Christ, aware of its own imperfection and its continual need for reformation. It is a justice which breeds longing and not complacency. The idea of pilgrimage is an inversion of a Platonic <coughs> metaphor. The Plotidian soul is on an odyssey or pilgrimage in this world of bodies, from which it hopes to ascend to a contemplative union with God apart from the world of bodies. Augustine's heavenly fellowship, by contrast, is on pilgrimage through what Augustine calls the earthly city, not through the world of bodies, which in fact it will never leave. The earthly city, Augustine remarks, is a kind of fellowship based on a common nature, although each group pursues its own advantages and seeks the gratification of its own desires. This generates a situation where human society is divided against itself, and one part of it always oppresses another, and it has been divided into a great number of empires. The city of God has existed throughout history as a people formed by a different kind of solidarity, emerging as being reformed away from the form of worldly love and conformed to the humility of God, which was to be fully revealed in Christ. And, though there can be times when Augustine's appeal to the promised <coughs> vision of Christ ahead of time can seem artificial to us, the visionary power of prophecy is really the new possibility for seeing, for vision and imagination, generated by solidarity in the humility of God, which is already, even in advance, solidarity in Christ. Prophecy is the forward-looking vision of, of people whose imaginations have been unfettered by faith in God's revelation. Platonism, by contrast, is the ideology of empire, the philosophy that permits the vision of the true God and the worship of the true God to be subverted into the complacency, the stasis, the immobility of the fellowship of this earth, which can achieve a semblance of solidarity only by domination. The image of pilgrimage is not simply an image of movement, but also an image of stasis. The city of God, continually constituted out of the church as it is purified and conformed to Christ's love, progresses by being reformed from what by contrast is static and stagnant the city of this world, the form of worldly love, which perpetually generates community that is no community. The city of God is on pilgrimage to this other city, imaginatively denominated Babylon, not through the world of bodies. To return to Book 10, Augustine argues that Porphyry and the other Platonists refuse to accept the Incarnation because they are proud. In order to accept the Incarnation and to submit to its purifying power in the Church, they would have to first admit that the link between body and soul is something wondrous, marvelous, and humbling, rather than finally something to be left behind. Augustine comments that it is actually less wondrous that one spirit should assume another, that is, that the Word of God, even though eternal, should assume another immaterial nature, the soul of a human being, than that that soul, an immaterial being, should be linked to a body. Anticipating remarks we have already noted in Book 22. That was anticipating remarks. It is the doctrine that final happiness involves an escape from all bodies that has allowed our own being, body and soul, to lapse into cheap familiarity, something that can be overlooked as insignificant. The body that is to be avoided to be left behind, naturally, since the body is that which belies any mythos or pretense of self-sufficiency. The body is that which gives the lie to pride, because it is so obviously needy and fleeting. Platonism nurtures pride by imagining salvation as fleeing from the body. That is, as something I, not being in any essential way linked to the body, can do on my own. The body can perish, and I can, as Romans 1.22 says, claim to be wise, 12. 
Well, I'm too. Claim to be wise and accept praise for my wisdom. This relieves me of any embarrassing need for gratitude. It also divides humanity into the dominating few, the wise, and the rest who are not wise, and who therefore must resort to some kind of appeal to the gods in order to purify the soul of its attachment to the body, at least to some degree. Platonism, from Augustine's point of view, has a vested interest in continuing to tolerate or even endorsing polytheism. Insofar as it is a philosophy of self-purgation, available only to the few, based on the purgation of the soul from any connection to the body, the Platonists can glory in their wisdom and appeal to the pride of those less talented by providing access to sacrificial rites that will, in effect, make them too the principles of their own purification, simply by enacting the rites and so forcing the hand of the gods. Here is reproduced the community that is no community, the community continually degenerating into self-serving domination and subordination, splintered and splintering. In Book 4, Augustine offers a parody of the pantheon of gods worshipped by the Romans. Here he describes, though in exaggerated form, the set of deities in charge of the countryside, the farms, the mountains, and the hillsides. After listing them all, he remarks, I shall not list them all. <laughs> that was kind of a joke. <laughs> For Augustine. But this very brief account is intended to make it clear that our opponents do not have the impudence to allege that the Roman Empire was established, increased, and preserved by those divinities who were so clearly confined to their own departments, Ulfikides, that no general responsibility was entrusted to any one of them. How could Nodutus help in war when his interest was confined to the note of the stock and did not even extend to the follicle? A skillful parody, but the subject of the parody is not only the pantheon of gods, but the imperial bureaucracy. The gods are pictured as a kind of extension of the bureaucracy, a kind of projection onto nature of the body politic. It is no wonder that nature has lost its wonder, has been cheapened by familiarity, when it has been, as it were, politicized, subsumed under the imperial project, reflecting back as in a mirror, not the glory of the creator, as Romans 1.20 says it should, but the glory of the empire, reducing nature to what will be later in Book 11 of the City of God, more prosaically described as the hierarchy of utility. Nature is reduced to the status of the commonplace, subsumed under the realm of the commonwealth, where it will not be a competitor against the empire for glory. The pantheon is nothing but the empire writ large, divinized, and thus we recognize in the parody the accusation that the Roman religion represented nothing but the apotheosis of the empire itself, which amounts to the sin of self-worship or pride. This is an image of society which has lost all perspective. It has lost any vantage point from which to have any self-perspective. It is at a standstill. The beauty of the physical world is referred not to the glory of God, but to the empire. The Platonist refusal to see the link between body and soul as the wondrous work of God empties the bodily world of its reference to God, its wonder, and leaves it to the mercy of the empire to define. The Platonist refusal to stand in awe at the link between body and soul denigrates human being as such, and so leaves any of its accomplishments in the realm of the body to the empire to define. Platonist refusal to see the divine miracle of the link between body and soul blinds them to true compassion, that is, to the Incarnation, and so they can no longer imagine it. This leaves the true worship of God, which is compassion, available for redefinition by the Empire. Once the true worship of God, compassion, is redirected towards the glory not of God, but of the Empire, one has eliminated the only true basis for true solidarity and the renewal of vision, the recovery of perspective, the opening of the imagination, which comes with it. Platonism, in Augustine's City of God, underwrites this complacency by assuring that no one at the very highest levels of culture will make the mistake of thinking that our own being, our own self, composed of body and soul, is anything to wonder at or feel grateful for. 
recognition of the source of this wonder and the object for such gratitude would threaten the whole imperial project of the hegemony of meaning. Platonism, as Augustine portrays it in The City of God, is an enabler of empire, selling us out to the tender mercies of imperium and the lust for domination which creates it. In that sense, Platonism, in Augustine's City of God, is an ideology of empire, pitting a specious and static contemplative vision against the forward-looking prophetic spirit that in every age has seen through the arrogance of all the kingdoms of this world and that ever gives voice to a new solidarity that transcends and perdures through them all. Thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School. <laughs>